How many choices have you made this morning already? One or two. You had to choose whether to get up or not, right? I'm sure maybe if you've eaten breakfast, you'd have chosen what you're going to have for breakfast. You have chosen what clothes you're going to wear. And you have chosen if you were going to come to church, and I'm glad you did. Uh, you have made a few choices, and, and, and probably many more, many more, this morning already. And I want to talk about choices today. I want to talk about choices because some choices are absolutely essential for our salvation. Some choices are absolutely essential for our Christian <coughs> walk in life. And some choices of whether which clothes you made for today are maybe not that terribly important. And we've got to make sure that those choices don't take precedent over the rest. In the Gospel today, we heard Jesus say, For many are called, but few are chosen. And there's been a great deal of debate over that, a debate, not debate, <laughs> debate over that, from, from Matthew's Gospel through the centuries as to what does it mean to be called and what does it mean to be chosen? And the biggest debate over is, is, is you know, the, the, the debate between free will and predestination. Who does the choosing? Is it that God chooses those whom he invites and goes to heaven? Or do we have any say in that? And what's clear, if you take this lesson in its context, what Jesus is saying here, it has a lot to do with our response. And the choosing is, yes, the choice of God, but it's a conscious choice of those who are chosen to respond to that choosing. And, and that comes from the context. We could never take scriptures out of their context and try to figure out what they mean until we see what Jesus is talking about. The best way to understand that is to look at who Jesus is talking to, what's his point, and, and how, what's he really saying here? You see, Jesus is in the temple. It's the last week of his life, and he is standing there debating with the priests and the Pharisees and the religious folks of the day. They have tried to challenge his authority. They want to kill him. And, and that's the who. He's, not, he's talking to, to, to the skeptics that perhaps have made some bad choices. You know, we talk about bad choices. How about that choice that in the first lesson today of uh, of building a calf. That didn't turn out well, did it? Yeah. You see, there's consequences <laughs> to choices. Even the small ones that we make. And the consequences within this context are grave if we don't choose God in this way. Anyway, in the context of all these parables, Jesus is showing how Israel has refused by choice Him and the path of God. He goes to begin, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call all those that have been invited to the banquet, but they would not come. This, this, this parable is about invitation. It's about God's inviting us into his kingdom. You know, the wedding banquet is a metaphor for the great celebration in heaven that's going to happen at the consummation of the age. The wedding banquet of the Lamb, His Son. And it is God's invitation for us and His people to come. He has chosen a chosen people. And, and what did it say? They just would not come. First, it's about invitation and refusal to a wedding banquet. Although, and throughout the Bible again, this is a real symbol of, of the kingdom of heaven. So that, with that first refusal, God in His mercy sent again His slaves out, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. If everything is ready, come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it when Isn't that uh, the, the, when God offers us the kingdom ourselves? Can we be like they did, too busy? Some went back to their business, some went back to their farm. And there was a choice. Come to the celebration of God or, or be consumed with the, with the cares of the world. And then there was a sense of anger with some of them. Leave me alone, but they got angry and they killed the messenger. Now, we sometimes, we are messengers, sometimes they do go after the messenger rather than the invitation. But that's 
part of that refusal, that's a, that's a sense of freedom. So then what did he do? The king invited everyone, good men. And that is God's grace. And he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, and those invited are not worthy. Go therefore to the main streets, invite everyone you can find to the wedding banquet. And they went out into the streets and gathered all whom they had found, both good and bad. You know, God calls everyone both good and bad. We've learned that over the course of the past months. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Jews, Gentiles, sinners, socially marginalized, those who we like, those who we don't like, everybody is called by God. He said that God so loved then something interesting happens. And hey, they, they answered the invitation, right? But what about this? Then the king came in to see the guests. Notice the man was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how do you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. And then we found out they threw him out and bound him into the outer darkness. That doesn't sound fair. You know, he, he, he accepted the invitation. But what? did he do and on what terms did he accept? You see, the wedding robe in those weddings, especially for a king's son, were given at the door to put on so that all would be dressed well. You wouldn't have to worry about what you were wearing. The wedding robe, uh, an incredible sign of God's righteousness poured onto us. And it was given to wear into the banquet. It wasn't something that they had to go out and purchase. It was another gift of grace from the host. Somebody refused that gift of grace. Could it be that even though we want to accept Christ's uh, uh, invitation into his kingdom through the death of his son, that we want to do it on our terms? We want to come in with our filthy rags, and we want to come in perhaps with our inappropriateness in our act actions, and not put on the righteousness of Christ? Could that be in the church? I think that's, again, a choice that many have. It's interesting that, that, that if you look at Revelation, you look at the, a picture of heaven that John sees, and he sees this throng of, of myriads and myriads of people that he can't even count, but what are they wearing? Christ. A white robe washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's how we enter into the wedding banquet. It's pure grace. Pure grace, not our works. And we need, and that's the condition, that's the terms by which we come in. So, this man made a choice to do it his way, to refuse the grace of God, and yet I want to come to the point. Choices. Another choice of God to refuse. And then again, what I said at the beginning, there are consequences to our choices. What's the consequences of refusing the grace of God and, and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? What are the choices that we have when we refuse to live the way that God calls us to live? Because there is a choice that we have. So who are called? Many are called. And in the Greek term, that word many means everybody. It means everyone are called or invited into God's kingdom, but few, and the Greek connotation is not all, and it could mean whomever are chosen, and that choice by God to them and the choice to respond, is, they go together, according to the parable, right? So we do have a choice. We do have a choice. And the question is, is that, have you been invited and we have been invited? What Have you made the choice to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Don't go away today without making that choice. And we'll pray about that in the end. But there's other choices in the way that we respond, like that man that came in without the wedding garment. Because we are now called to make choices to conform our lives into the image of God. And when we do, we're going to learn that God will bless and peace, uh, and His peace will be upon us. The obvious choice again, accepting God's invitation to the bank. I don't know. We had a wedding last night. It was quite a celebration. But we've invite, invited into God's kingdom by Him, and when we do, then now what does He ask us to do? 
He asked, asked us to invite others, right? That's a choice. Are we going to invite people into the kingdom of God? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are we making a choice to refuse God's invitation for us to make an invitation to others? That's the choice. And that, and that if we don't make that choice, what are the consequences? Our church is not going to grow. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be disobedient to God. A choice. A choice. Our church, our leadership, our best we made a choice in our mission statement to say yes. To say we will invite and challenge and share what we have. But the choice is ours if we are going to fulfill what God has done. Choices. So that, and, and if we do choose to fulfill that, then comes the next step of our Christian faith. If we find people that enter God's kingdom, are we then a, a true reflection of what that kingdom looks like, or are we misrepresenting God? So what I make here is it's a choice that we have to, be, to make to be transformed into the kingdom of God. Individually, if someone in the world sees us, will they see a difference? Will they see something that is desirable to change to, to be invited to? Hey, I invite you to come down to, uh, to the, uh, the refuge collection area to have a picnic. That doesn't sound like a really good invitation. <laughs> I invite you to enter into a life with Christ that looks different than the world. That's an invitation. Because I think, well, I know, people are looking for that, aren't they? This world's falling apart. And we need to be different as a church. I invite you to come in and look at a group of people that don't have a common mentality, that are, that are all doing their own thing, that all want in their way, and argue with each other all the way down the line. That, that sounds like the world. We want to even invite people into our life together that is different. I, an invitation, okay? And how we do that is a choice. It is not, I can't help it. It's a choice. It's a, it's a conscious choice that we have to make. The devil does not make us do it. Because if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. That's a choice. If we invite the Holy Spirit into us, he will help us. And he will change us. And that's a choice. And Paul, over and over again, in almost every letter he wrote, gives us the choice. In Ephesians, he said this, I urge you now to live a life worthy of the calling you've been received. He says, be completely humble and gentle and patient and bearing with one another in love and make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Choices. We can choose to do that or we can choose to live the way we want to. Choices. And God gives us the Holy Spirit to be able to make the right choices. To the Colossians he wrote, Therefore, as God's chosen people, they, he shows us, you're holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive what grievances you may have. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these things Put on love which binds it all together. Choices. Do you choose to have compassion? Do you choose to be kind? Do you choose to be live in humility? Do we choose to be gentle? Do we choose to be patient? Forgiveness is a choice. Letting go of that. Putting on love. And he goes on with, with the, the Colossian church. He said, then let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. That's a choice. Since the members of one body are called to peace, be thankful. That's a choice. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Read your scripture. That's a choice. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father, God the Father through Him. That's a... Let's hear the word. Come on. Choice. And today in Philippians, not only are we given more choices, which are very sound the same, but He gives us a way to do it. A way to look differently. So the suggestions in life. Therefore, is the 
first word of today's message. Remember, if you've been here for the last few weeks, therefore it's a very important word. Because it, it's hinged on everything that God had said before, that Paul had said before that. And what did Paul say? He said, you guys are special people. You're called by God. He said, you should live a life worthy of that. You should count others as more important to you than yourselves. You should live a humble life. And, and take on, and we heard a couple weeks ago, uh, do it, you know, take on the mind of Christ. Who, did, who found himself in the form of God but didn't count it, it, it something to be held on to, but emptied himself. He emptied himself for you and me. So all that, of all of that, work out your own salvation with fear of trembling. God is going to finish the work in you, but there's a choice. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown, now stand firm in the Lord in this way. But what's the first thing he says? To those two ladies whom you probably can't pronounce their names, but Janet did a fabulous job. Yoria <laughs> and Suntike, or Suntike, to be of the same mind in the Lord. What's he asking them to do? Reconcile. Right? Forgive each other. These two ladies have been fighting, and they won't give up. In the church of Philippi, he says it begins, the, the grace of God and the transformation begins with forgiveness. It, and reconciliation, that's the mission of us, forgive, that leads to what? Another main theme of Paul, unity. We can't come together unless we forgive. We forgive each other. And forgiveness is a choice. Then he goes on to some tough choices. And these are the ones I think we struggle with, but with the Holy Spirit we can attain that. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And you notice he doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when everything is going well. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You see, how we respond to life is a choice. And we can take the good things of life and respond well. But when struggle comes, how do we, it's a choice how we wake up and, and, and deal with it. And, and he wants us to rejoice in the sense that it's an extension of our faith. Because what does our faith tell us? We sang about it in our first song this morning, our, that he is faithful, and that during difficult times, he's standing right next to us to, to help us to grow in that. And it's hard to rejoice in difficult times. But we're called to do that, aren't we? That's what Paul said. And if we do, we're going to see changes in our lives. We can, we can, again, when things are hard, become terribly closed up and angry. And, and when, we, when we are closed up and angry and our fists are clenched, can't we indeed reflect God's love? So he's calling us to rejoice even in the bad. And it's a choice that we can make. And, and, and interestingly, it's catchy. And if you're grumpy when you get up in the morning, just look in the mirror and smile. And that may be just the thing that breaks the, uh, the ice, right? Breaks the, 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 the shell. Rejoice in the Lord always, and it's so important that he repeats it. And again, I say rejoice. See, God is good. God is good. Give thanks in all things. Then next, let your gentleness be known to everyone. For the Lord is near. The gentleness, a characteristic of God. How do we treat one another? If we, tr if we look, truly learn gentleness, uh, what different wor world will we live in? If we deal harshly with, with, with others, even our kids, we can correct the gentleness. We can live together with gentleness. He calls us to that. And it's, it's again a characteristic of the kingdom of heaven, is this sense of gentleness. And then the, 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 the one that's really easy, the choice that's really easy to make. Now, we can make a choice to be gentle. Do, do not worry about anything, right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your regrets be made known to God. <coughs> worry tells My mom taught me how to worry at a very early age. She had... Um, and it's still something that I try to overcome. What happens when, we, when we're fretful over things? 
Do we close down? I think we, it really does take our joy away. It takes our rejoicing away. It, it really hinders us. So he calls us to not worry, and it's a choice, because worry is about faith and trust in God. Jesus, how many times did Jesus say, don't worry? Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough troubles of its own. Don't worry, because even the birds of the air get to eat, and they sing, and they, 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 they're beautiful. And even the crows that hang out here in the daytime, God's taking care of them. They're eating something that's provided by Him. Probably all the acorns that are falling, right? The deer are all there, stuff full of happiness, until y'all go and find them. But that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody's happy to have it. <laughs> so, in fact, I have to tell you a story. This has nothing to do with what I'm saying, but, but uh, we're we're going to uh, actually Doug and Barb's. I was taking uh, 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 Robert over there last week, and as we were driving up, about four or five deer were walking across the the uh, roadway. And you know what Robert's word was? Meat. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. But, but then he said even the, the, uh, the, the flowers out there are taken care of by God. How beautiful they are. And, and God does that. Doesn't he care even more for your life? So worry could bind us up and take away our joy, take away our ability to really represent the kingdom of God. Don't be grumpy, that's a choice. And a worry, sometimes when we focus on things, we can, we can get so negative. We start complaining, and then we start looking for all of the bad things in life that are out there. And we don't want to live negatively. So what happens when we don't worry, when we, when we live in, in gentleness? What happens when we rejoice? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let go, rejoice, be gentle, trust God. Don't let worry consume you. And God will guard your heart, and the peace of God will be in you. So he tells us how to get that, that status by the choices we make, and we're going to obey what God calls us to do. Or are we going to say, nah, I'm too busy. Nah, it doesn't work. Nah, I want to be miserable. Well, that's, again, a choice. And finally, beloved, it's about, again, that negative mindset. How many of us ever, or have you ever gotten to the point where all you want to do all you see is the, is the dark side of things. And what will you do? What does that lead to? It leads to all the things that Paul is trying to tell us to not do. So finally, he says here, Beloved, whatever is true and honorable and just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, do what? Thank you about these things. That's a choice. A choice to focus on good and God and truth and justice and pleasing and pure and excellence and worthy of praise. And gosh, when we start thinking about positive things, it will consume our hearts and minds and our faith will grow and we will indeed be transformed into the church and the people that God calls us to. Choices. So think about your choices. And don't make excuses. Because we can't overcome. Because Jesus said, I will complete the work that I have given to you, through you, until the coming of Jesus Christ. Promises of God. So let's deal with the first one, the most important. If you've not made a choice to enter into the kingdom of God, I ask that you would make that choice today to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. I choose to accept the sacrifice of Christ who died for my sins and has given me new life. That's a choice. I choose to come to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. Make that choice. Make that choice if you have not. And secondly, I choose to live my life for Christ so that I can be an adequate reflection of that. I choose to have His peace. I choose to rethink my mind. These choices. And these choices, yes, are public, but they're also choices that are deep in your heart that you need to make with God. So we're going to bow our heads.
give you a moment to respond. Father in heaven, I choose to accept your gift of salvation through the death, life, resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. And by this statement of faith, I am saved, as you have said in your scripture. Thank you, Lord, for the gift. I accept the invitation. And Lord, you called me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, transformed in my life to reflect your glory, grace, and glory. Today I make the choice to say yes. I make the choice to have a, a, a gentle spirit. I make the choice to rejoice in all things. And I make this choice to give it up to you that I not have worry that binds my life, knowing that all things are from you, and you are good in all things. And Father, finally, Father, I make a choice to think of good things, to rid my mind of criticism and thought, to open my heart to your grace and glory. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep my mind and heart in the knowledge and love of God. So thank you, Lord, and give me the strength to continue in the choices that I have made. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah.